my name is Anna Borg. I'm excited and happy to be here. I'm curious, how many of you work with self-leadership today? How many of you are... What? Let's see. How many of you are eager to get something concrete out of the day? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I hope I'm going to be able to fulfill your expectations. For the next about 40 minutes, we're going to talk about self-leadership, what it is and why it matters. Uh, I'm also going to round off with giving you a few tools. It should be said that this, in this talk, I'm going to talk from a leader perspective to an employee perspective. Um, I'm not going to debate whether that's the right acronym or if it's manager to employee or coach to individual, but I'm going to use leader to employee. And however, even though you have another role or you're a freelancer or a manager or C-level, it doesn't matter. You're still going to be able to apply the things we're going to talk about today. So there are quite a few companies out there that are applying self-leadership theories today. Companies like LinkedIn, Atlassian, Netflix, Google, uh, and a company that actually had a CEO for 40 years uh, that are probably more known for their leadership style uh, was a company called Semco Partners, a Brazilian conglomerate. They were making sure there was a culture within the company where employers were asking why and what they were doing, what they were doing. That meant that the power was shifted over to the employees from the leadership and the management structure. When people ask me what self-leadership is and what is actually a good self-leader, I say that someone who's good at self-leadership are great at designing their own life. What does that mean? Well, it means more or less that you lead your life with intention. You're building skills that make you aware of what you're doing and why you're doing it. We're going to come back to this and dig a little bit deeper. But in general, designing your own life, that's what it's about. So you, in, in the role that you as a leader, you're going to be able and support and empower your employees or your team to lead themselves better. Um, I have a vision, and that's, that is that when I'm 90 years old, I'm going to sit in a rocking chair on uh, my porch, um, drinking whiskey and uh, smoking a cigar. Um, while I do that, I'm going to have friends, family, my siblings' kids, hope, hopefully my grandkids, coming by, talking about the experiences we have had in life and the experience we, experiences we are still having. I created this vision five years ago when I felt a little bit lost on what I was going to do next in life. I use my vision. Uh, she's just visualized as a 90-year-old on the porch, uh, as a person to guide me when I don't really know what my answer is going to be about what I'm supposed to do next. Or when I'm facing something complex and I'm thinking about, oh, should I start a company or should I not? And should I have a kid or should I not? Then I use my 90-year-old. Oh, uh, but... I also have complemented this vision because sometimes it's a bit hard to ask someone who's 90 years old what they're going to do in the next 10 years. So I have a few dreams and um, therefore today um, my, the main, well, the main, uh, my main energy goes into a company where I'm a CEO, uh, design and innovation consultancy called Top, uh, recently um, acquired by a company called ManyOne. But I also uh, sit on a board for a startup house here in Malmö. I'm an angel investor and I run small projects and experiment whenever I feel like I need to get closer to one of those dreams that I'm having. So that's my way of designing my own life. I have visions, I have dreams, I have activities. I make sure of connecting those. And therefore, I can lead my life with intention. 
for the last 15 years, I've worked with creatives and entrepreneurs in different ways. I've seen people stagnate. I've seen people bloom. And I've found that there are a few, there are some theories and practices that enable people people to kind of flourish even more and grow even faster and kind of enables them to reach their potential. Those we're going to talk about today. But I want you to meet Emil first. Uh, Emil is a system engineer. We use or we started to work together uh, many years ago. Then Emil was working as a technologist, but he was thinking a lot around collaboration within teams. And how can I, as a technologist, collaborate better with designers? However, Emil thought that he is the developer, so why should he care about collaboration with designers? Or why should he have an opinion about collaboration with designers? And why should he build those skills? I was curious about his drive and his kind of uh, eagerness to kind of thinking around the topic. So we started to discuss this and we set up a few goals and a few activities. We decided that he was supposed to uh, or his goal was to be able to facilitate a team that he was not part of. But we also took it down to small bits and activities so he could get started and build some new skills. So he started out by having a discussion internally within his team uh, about if they going to be able to, how they could collaborate better together. And after some time, he was not able to only facilitate and be a catalyst internally for ways of working. He also started to facilitate clients and advise them on their way of working. Today, today Emil is not only a system engineer, he's also a lead technologist. He has evolved new skills and became become a UX designer. He sell and pitch projects and he's a por partner at top. So self-leadership as a theory is not that hard. The challenge is getting there. And the reason is because, first of all, we need to change our habits. Changing habits are not something that happens overnight. It takes a long time. It takes quite a lot of self-awareness and motivation to get there. The second is that, just as in Emil's case, you often need to uh, change the perception of yourself or the per perception of something, meaning that Emil wasn't originally thinking that I'm a system engineer, so I'm not supposed to care about collaboration. Well, how do you change that mindset? It doesn't happen overnight. And then the third thing, and this I would say probably 98% of all of us in here are grown up and trained in an environment where we are not supposed to be self-led. Let me explain why. So curriculums that are the curriculums we have in school are all about uh, following them making sure that you find out how to solve something making sure that you're answering questions right anyone recognize that yeah that continues in a university potentially even more someone tells you exactly what to do and what books to read and how to answer those questions Later, we come out in a, in a work environment and probably the guys of you that are in a context where you have more of maybe applied holacracy or teal, you have a little bit of a different setup. But otherwise, most of us are in some sort of hierarchy where we are told what to do when we probably get instructions the day we start on. This is the onboarding process and do this and do that. Those patterns are pretty challenging to break. Therefore, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, <clears throat> well, if it's hard, why should we invest in doing it? Well, self-leadership is, uh, is a theory that has evolved over the last 40 years. 
it started uh, with the entrance of the knowledge worker era. In opposite to the industrial era, which is all about hierarchies and optimization and high productivity, knowledge worker era is all about making sure that you are growing the knowledge and skills in your company because that's what brings value. So self-leadership is great for that. It's all about growing and evolving. On top of that, we have a, complexity, or a complex environment. We have fast evolving technology. And a lot of us are working or have team members that are working remotely. So more self-led people are great for that. There are multiple studies out there that uh, are in alignment about the positive outcomes of self-leadership. Things like improved uh, personal development, po positive work behavior, but also things like improved mental health, a uh, super big challenge, especially uh, that we've also seen lately over the last few years with the entrance of uh, more remote work. And in addition to that, you as a leader, manager, will also have more independent people, meaning that your time can be spent differently, less on instructions and tasks, and rather on big strokes and directions. And when you, or if you already know, or when you are coming back and be like, ah, should we start doing this? Then I think uh, the main rationale, if you're bringing it into the boardroom or to another uh, executive, is improved performance. There are plenty of studies, all are pointing to the fact that self-leadership leads to improved performance. So what is self-leadership then? about designing one's life, having intention. Um, I would say there are three cornerstones. First one is that you're setting a direction. Uh, for me, it was dreams and visions. For Emily, it was goals. Set some uh, direction and plan activities to follow that. So you're starting to do something and starting to experiment with something. Then the second skill you want to build is mind leadership. And I'm not talking about mindfulness or uh, meditation. Those are also good skills to build. I'm talking about becoming aware of how you think and feel. And by becoming aware, you can monitor how you think and feel. Uh, let me give you an example. Before, when I was planning this talk, I knew that the moment I'm on my way up to stage, I'm going to feel excited, but I'm also going to feel nervous. That means that my heart is going to start uh, pump uh, faster, and I'm probably going to start talking faster. So I'm visualizing, I'm, I'm aware this is going to happen. I'm visualizing it in front of me, but instead of letting that be the case, I'm trying to create another scenario. So with my awareness, I'm, st I'm, I'm planning that, okay, instead I'm going to stop, I'm going to try to breathe, take a two, two deep breath and let my shoulders down. In that way, I will hopefully be able to speak a bit slower and you're gonna be able to follow what I'm saying a little bit better. Third cornerstone, natural rewards. Natural rewards are that you are feeling uh, joy from what you are doing or what you're experiencing. It's kind of the opposite of external rewards, things like someone else telling you you're great, uh, getting a raise, getting a promotion, uh, getting a new title. Natural rewards are all about feeling great when you're doing something. And um, um, on, on top of that, what happens when you're feeling great, when you're doing something, is that you normally also get some sort of dopamine addition as you're doing it. Three cornerstones. Um, hopefully you now think, okay, I think I'm starting to get this. I kind of know what self-leadership is. Let's talk a little bit about what it's not. Oh. So... 
um, here are a few skills, great skills to have, great skills to build if you don't have them. Uh, however, not self-leadership skills. Let's talk a little bit about why. Time management, stress management, focus on tasks, discipline, focus on how and self-motivation are all kind of skills that are uh, focusing on following something or a direction. So it's not dependent on you building a skill in your own. Um, some of you might have heard of self-management. I would say these are typical self-management skills. If we would look on the other side of that, I would say the skills you want to build yourself or enable and help others build are things like autonomy. Autonomy means that people are able to feel confident in the decisions and things they're doing. Self-reflection, leading the mind, becoming aware of what you're doing. Focus on progress, so rather on focusing on doing, uh, doing uh, the right thing, focus on doing things right. Therefore, questioning why or what you are doing is important. You want to enable and empower people. You don't want them to be dependent on that you're telling them what to do. So, um, and there is actually a super easy trick to kind of start doing this more. When people come and ask you questions like, oh, should I do this or that? Then ask them back, what is your answer? What, what, would, what do you think? Because a lot of times people no, and sometimes they don't know that they know, or sometimes they don't, they're not comfortable in saying it. But the more you are asking people to find the answers themselves, the better they become, or first of all, you're enabling and empower them, and the better they become at actually realizing what do I think and what do I feel. And then, um, growing self-awareness. Self-awareness and self-reflection are probably, or go very well together. Um, self-reflection can be done um, in therapy. Self-reflection can be done by reflecting after a project. Self-reflection can be done in a feedback session. Self-reflection can be done together with your leader or together with your peer or do uh, 360. So it's all about getting information and <laughs> analyzing what you think or feel about something. Um, a company uh, that does this on like a, or a local company, a Danish company is, uh, is a company called Impact Consulting. They have uh, a principle where they get to choose their own leader. So instead of having a typical hierarchy of, oh, you're assigned to this and you're assigned to that one and this is your boss and you get hired into be part of that boss team, you get to choose your own leader. That also means that over time you can change your leader depending on how you're growing and what you're doing. Um, that, of course, removes hierarchy, but what it also does is that it, actually fosters a culture of making, reflecting on where you want to go, what you want to learn, and also taking actions and being proactive. And that's it's similar to asking, asking people questions, like you're asking them to be proactive instead of reactive. There are um, a few tools that I use that I find more efficient than others. Um, and I'm going to share these six tools with you now. The first one is principles. And principles is a, in a true spirit of self-leadership instead of instructions or to-do list, it's principles. Those are supposed to help you navigate how to lead. Three things. First one, 
if you're deciding to start working with self-leadership, you should see it as you're investing in foundational change. Breaking habits can take everything from eight days to 254 days. Don't have a one month perspective. You're not gonna be able to evaluate how you're progressing in one month. Rather take maybe a three, six, 12 months perspective and look on how people are evolving on the longer term rather than day to day. Second is that you as a leader, manager, coach, uh, should expect that you will need to adapt. So uh, if you're a leader, you're probably going to experience that working with uh, one person probably requires a more of uh, mentor skills. Working with another person potentially requires more coaching skills. Whereas if they're very early and are, for example, not very good with self-reflection or being self-aware, I would say that you probably need to be a bit more um, of a director. So adapting as the, as the person grows, adapting as the, uh, the team grows, but also depending on what phase they're in. Oh, third one. Um, you should expect that, or you want to work with people who are motivated to evolve. So we are all... Um, and now I'm talking about working with humans. So I'm not talking about AI. I'm talking working with humans. Humans are naturally evolving, whether we want it or not. The amount of evolvement we will do depends on how much effort you put into something, right? The more effort, the more outcome. Um, but the, um, so the more effort, the more outcome. You, but you want to make sure that you're working with people who are ready to and are motivated to evolve um, and I think I, I learned this um, I had a few people over the time that were not ready to do it I had one person I think that was probably my uh, biggest mistake when it came to this and that's one of the reasons why I have this principle I was working with the designer for two years let's call him Charlie uh, Charlie had a few different skills uh, skill sets within design um, he had great potential, but he never wanted to learn something new. I tried for two years, working with him, setting up goals, setting up activities, trying to nudge him in a specific direction, trying to motivate him to do something new. Nothing happened. After two years, nothing happened. Then I realized I need to stop doing this. Charlie never evolved remarkably over the next five years we worked together, it should be said. However, what it taught me was that self-leadership is not for everyone. You need to be at least, at least self-motivated to get started. Because if you're not self-motivated, if you're not ready and open to learn, then the first thing you need to figure out if you're working together with a person is how can we enable this person to learn? And that's not what self-leadership is about. Self-leadership is about having people who are eager and wanting to evolve. So, if you have a team and some are eager and some are not, the answer is not, no, you should not work with self-leadership. Maybe you should work with self-leadership with most of the people, but maybe not with everyone, because everyone are not ready and are never going to be... Mm, open to take the step over to self-leadership. Second, this one, super basic, uh, structures. So working with self-leadership, I want to make sure that people spend their energy on the right thing and that we both are, have the same expectations when we're working together and that people can feel that they are empowered to take decisions and know what we're going to talk about. So I use things like uh, recurring one-on-ones when I work with individuals. For each one-on-one, there is a set agenda. Uh, they happen on a frequent basis. S same things if I work with teams. Regular team syncs, openness about the agenda, 
so that both I and the other person I'm working with can come in and take leadership in the in the meeting we're having. You don't want them to focus on, oh, is this uh, structure the right for building my skills when we're working together? You want them to focus on where they're going. Super basic, but very important. Third, direction. So, um, uh, so, so we are after creating value where we're connecting individuals to the company. Uh, I think, I don't know, how many of you have experienced being kind of in a position where someone asks you to create goals and you don't understand how are this connected to what I'm doing or where the company is going? Anyone recognize that? Yeah, quite a fair bit. The problem is that a lot of people are taught that we should set goals, but they're not taught that the goals and the direction we're heading in should be in synergy with the company that we're trying to create. Because when it's in synergy, what happens is that the things you're doing on a regular basis, the things that your employers are doing on a regular basis, feel meaningful. You're contributing to something. You're feeling belonging. That's why you as a leader, it's your responsibility to make sure that the company direction is tangible for the individual. And then I always make sure to have a vision for the individual I'm working with. A lot of times uh, creating a vision that's far in the future is a bit uh, challenging for people, especially when you start kind of working with goals and, and activities. So I always make sure to have a vision so I know in which, direct in which direction I'm nudging this person. Then you help them to set up goals and you help them to set up activities. By connecting the company direction and the individual activities. Relationship. So you are in this together. The individual you're working with should not feel alone, but you shouldn't neither feel alone. So both of you have to make and take responsibility for this to work. Um, I have a simple kind of model that I share with, with people when I work with them. And, and it goes like this, together in the sessions that you um, you, me and the employer have, we define goals and we recommit to goals. Meaning in a session we would uh, check in, are we on the right direction? Should we change the goal? Should we change the activity? Those things we're doing together. I'm a, as a leader is responsible for making sure that we have those. However, when it comes to testing things, to doing things, to completing the goal, I cannot be responsible as a leader. It's not my responsibility to be motivated. It's not my responsibility to do it. That's upon the employer. And I think here, um, I've seen some organizations where employees have a little bit too much um, kind of, uh, how would you say, uh, sitting in the back seat kind of syndrome where they never go in and take responsibility for anything. You cannot, as a leader, take responsibility for those things because the activities are not done with, by you. Fifth one, also fairly basic, uh, but you as a leader, of course, also need to design your own path. The better you become at leading yourself, the better other people are going to become at leading yourself. Set up visions, goals, activities, what works for you, but make sure you have some sort of direction and some intent with what you're doing. Sixth one, experiment. It's all about doing. Thinking is great when you're reflecting upon something, but you need to try things out. You need to start the experiment. If um, if you go home and have a conversation with HR and they say, oh, great, 
let's implement that. Please say no. Say no, stop them immediately. That's insane. You don't implement something you don't have skills for, or you don't implement something you haven't experimented or tested with. It's like building a prototype. We need to do it. So uh, in this case, I would say if you haven't like tried building these types of skills intentionally before, uh, I would pick maybe one to two people or one team and start working with them. Choose the ones that are eager, that are interested or excited to evolve, because partly it's going to be easier. Great. Good start. More smooth start. But what's going to happen is that you are also going to be able to build skills in a more safe environment, in a better environment. So start small and start experimenting. And you can do that even though no one agrees about it. You don't even have to tell anyone. So six tools. Um, go try them out. See what works for you. Um, build some other principles if that makes sense. I think the important thing is to remember that it's skill sets that you're building. You're building skill sets so people can be more uh, self-driven. You, you're building skill sets so they're able to be proactive. So you don't have to be in between the cracks of making sure everything is working or that an individual feeling confident, but they're building the, I would say, almost the, the self-love themselves. It doesn't have to come from, from a salary raise or you telling them they're good. They're happy with what they're doing. So enable people to design their lives with intention. It's great. It's very aligned with uh, the knowledge work era that we're in, where the value comes in that an organization grow. Um, hierarchies are great, but if you want people to stay for a long time, if you're ready to invest in the long term, self-leadership is a very good way and good skill sets for building. But please start by asking yourself if it's good for you, if it's good for the people you're working with, if it's good for the team that you're working with. It's not for everybody, and it doesn't necessarily need to be in the context you are today or with the people we are today. Um, I have uh, a few articles, a few tools on my LinkedIn. Um, so please go in and have a look. Uh, reach out if you have some more questions or you need support or just have a coffee, remote coffee, to talk about it. Questions? <gasps> yes. Hmm. Um, so I don't know in this particular case, what I know about them is that they have a system where um, people kind of sell projects and then people get to pick the project they want to be on. But they also need to make sure they're billable. So I assume there is an incentive kind of structure into that that is actually enabling this, because I think it's a good point. You want to make sure that the system is also working in the direction you want to go. So, for example, if you are, and we're talking about it on a more syst uh, systematic level, if uh, people or the organization is not promoting people to take initiatives, then it's going to be hard to enable someone to become more self-led, as an example. So. 
Therefore, I think it's important to ask, is this right for you and your organization? And see, are we, is this going to be too hard to make sure to do it internally or too hard to do it internally? Like do, is the entire culture built on people uh, becoming better than the other one or stabbing someone in the back? That's going to be challenging. I think you can still work with self-leadership, but then I think you should be aligned on that this maybe applies more outside than inside work, as an example. Did I ask some of your questions? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Good question. Uh, yes, there is, uh, um, there is a guy called Charles Mantz. Uh, he has written several books. Um, he's written several books and done plenty of studies on the subject. He's also been co-author of um, multiple studies with others. So uh, check out his name. I think also, oh, what is his name? Um, Ross is his last name. Um, but I can uh, I can post a few things also on my LinkedIn. A month uh, with a set at the end, yeah. Other questions? Yes. Uh, I mean, so I see it as a leader who is a leader shouldn't be able to use those three different skill sets. So coaching in the terms of you're asking more that, and you're looking for the answer within the individual, whereas mentoring is more supporting them in saying, this is probably a good direction when they're asking. And the direction is almost more like telling them what to do. So a little bit different, uh, but I think from a perspective, if you're a leader, I think you should practice all of them because you will need to apply them at different times and different contexts. Other questions? We have three more minutes before I'm thrown out of stage. Okay, thank you guys so much.